All right. All right, so I want to begin with a question for you tonight. Some of you haven't seen people in a while, I get it. Hey, as we begin tonight, here's a question I want to begin with. When was the last time, when was the last time you were overwhelmed by extravagance? When was the last time you were overwhelmed by extravagance? Maybe it happened at a wedding. I've been at a few hundred weddings in my life, and you may say, well, really, wow, why? Well, most of them because I was performing them as a, as a pastor. And in those hundreds of weddings that I've been to, there's been at least two times that I walked in and went, all right, this is going to be a party. Because I was overwhelmed by the sheer amount of food and stuff that was going on in the reception. And I thought to myself, this, this is amazing, overwhelming. Maybe... Maybe for you, it's happened at a place. I, I walked into a stadium of all places and got overwhelmed about 10 years ago. The Dallas Cowboys opened a, a new stadium 10, 12 years ago called Jerry World. It's really not. That's just what everybody else calls it because their owner's name is Jerry Jones. The place called, cost $1.1 billion with a B, billion. There's a scoreboard that's in the middle of the stadium. Have you ever seen this? It hangs down in the middle of the stadium and, and the scoreboard is, the, is a jumbotron that that basically goes from almost the 20 yard line to the 20 yard line and it's $40 million for this four-sided scoreboard which is the hugest thing you've ever seen in your life just for the scoreboard. And the whole purpose he did that was so that you would walk in and be amazed, overwhelmed by the extravagance of what they built. About 20 years ago, a little bit longer than 20 years ago, almost 30 years ago, I got to go to a place in Russia called Catherine's Palace. I want you to see this, I got a bunch of pictures here. It was built by a guy named Peter the Great, her husband, and he spent a whole lot of money on his wife. And it was a, a winter palace for them, a place to go, to go get away from the world, and I'm sure they figured out how to do that in this place. This one room that I, that I want you to see, this last room on here, was they had to restore this whole thing because when World War II happened and the Germans came through Russia, they basically destroyed this whole thing and they took all of this amber off the walls, ripped it all. And when they rebuilt this whole thing, when the Russian government rebuilt this whole thing, that room alone cost them $25 million. When you walk into a place like that, you're overwhelmed by the extravagance. You're overwhelmed by, by somebody's creativity. You're overwhelmed by somebody's ability to pull this off. But more than anything else, you just stand there and think, wow. Now, human extravagance stuns us. It reveals, to some degree, the greatness of the giver, right? And at least their extravagance. Sometimes it reveals the, the giver, who the giver loves. In this case, Peter the Great loved his wife, Catherine. In Jerry Jones' case, he loves himself. That's why he built the giant stadium. <laughs> it also reveals, to some degree in us, this question of, like, is this worth it? I mean, every time I've been someplace like this where I was overwhelmed by the amount of just sheer dollars that were spent, there was a part of me that starts asking questions like, is, was this needed? Is this deserved? Was it worth it? Let me make this a little more personal. When was the last time someone gave to you in an extravagant way? Because no one's probably ever built you a palace like that or a stadium. Maybe you're one of the few girls in this room that your dad really went way overboard at your wedding. That's awesome. But for most of us, like, there's that one or two times in your life where you really got stunned by the lavishness that somebody poured out on you. You were stunned and overwhelmed by the excessiveness, maybe even a little bit embarrassed, maybe a little bit taken aback. And what you realized right away is the extravagance. You started looking at the person who gave this to you differently. You're like, I see you. Because of the way they lavished on you. And then you realize like, man, you were being seen. Like somebody wanted to actually pour out this kind of extravagance on you. But then there's this side of human extravagance that starts creeping up in all of us and we start asking these questions. Like, why did they do this? What, what did I do to deserve this? And, and there's sometimes it comes out really selfish, like, man, it's about time you did this. It's about time you noticed me. But a lot of times it comes out in the, that I, I really deserve all this. Extravagant giving shines a huge revealing light into our hearts. It just opens up something in our hearts that maybe nothing else does. And human extravagance prompts our hearts 
Human extravagance that prompts our hearts in ways that's, that's not ruled by God. When, when we see human extravagance or we get a chance to give extravagantly to other people, there's, there's all sorts of usually selfish reasons we're doing that. We want somebody to, to notice us. We wanna, we wanna say, we wanna be looked at. We wanna, we wanna make much of somebody maybe. And it's not always selfish, but a lot of times it is. But something happens when godly extravagance enters the picture that changes the whole course of things and it reveals something completely different about us and God. Chapter seven of, of Corinthians, Second Corinthians, where we just finished, God was speaking through Paul this idea of godly grief, of what it looks like for you and I to walk in godly grief and repentance and reconciliation. There was a call to godly grief. Well, as he starts a new chapter here, we're jumping into chapter eight. There might be a little applause for that because we've been in seven for a while. Um, but we're going into chapter eight and he's gonna not really change the subject so much, but he's really gonna change the emphasis because he's gonna go from godly grief here in chapter seven into godly extravagance. And specifically, he's gonna talk about what godly extravagant giving looks like. He's gonna spend the whole next two chapters, chapter eight and nine, talking about giving. And I want you to hear this as we, as we launch into this. When, whenever you start talking about giving in a church, everybody everybody's, gets a little what I call the butt wiggles in their seats. And that, that happens whenever we start talking about things that we normally don't talk about to one another. I just wanna encourage you and ask you this question. When was the last time in your prayer group or your accountability group or the people that you love and walk with in Jesus, you talked about how you spend your money? Why is that? that we rarely talk about those things. Man, we'll talk about porn, we'll talk about lust, we'll talk about all sorts of idols that we, we're trying to avoid in our life, comfort and all these different things. And yet when somebody brings, like how, brings up how do you spend your money, it gets a little bit quiet. And I wanna encourage you that God's word's not quiet on this. Jesus talked about hell a ton. He talked about heaven a ton, but he talked about money more. And there's a reason for that. It's not because Jesus needed your money. It's not because the church needs your money. It's because something about your money says something about who has your heart. And God's gonna open this up for us as we jump into chapter eight. And so what we're gonna do as we walk through chapter eight and we look at this idea of extra extravagant godly giving is we're gonna, we're gonna look at the what, like what is extravagant godly giving? We're gonna look at the why because that's hugely important. Why is God calling us to? And I think even... Most important at the end, we're gonna look at how. Like how do we actually do something that is godly in nature as opposed to human in nature? So if you're ready, let's jump in. Chapter eight, verse one. This is Second Corinthians chapter eight. If you've got your Bibles, I wanna encourage you to go there. Chapter eight, verse one. Paul begins this way. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches in Macedonia. Two things to note here as we jump into verse one. Background, Paul is in Macedonia writing this. Mark talked about this last week, that it was in Macedonia that he found his friend Titus as he's been looking for him. And so he's, he's with these Macedonian churches, which is north up the Asian peninsula. And he's in this place, and, and we're not really sure where, but he's in Macedonia. And he's there that he's found Titus, and he's writing to this Corinthian church. And he's going to tell this Corinthian church about a grace of God that's been poured out on these Macedonian churches. So background, that's where he is. That's what's going on. Second, word I want you, second thing I want you to notice here is grace. Grace, this word in the, in the Greek, sometimes you've heard it, charis or charis, depending on how you say it. This word is used, or some form of this word is used 10 times in the next two chapters. Paul writes this out 10 times, this word grace. Paul uses it in all his writings 85 times. He was known as the apostle of grace, which is quite strange to me because he was a man of the law before this. All he knew was the law. All he knew how to do was to keep the letter of the law. And he believed that everything that God would do if he didn't keep the law was punish him. And now he becomes a man who knows the grace of God because Jesus has taken his punishment. And he knows this so deeply and so well that he writes about it over and over and over again. But for most of us, grace is one of these words like love that we, we use in all sorts of ways and we're really not sure how. We, we see it on commercials when we hear about credit cards giving you a grace period. What, what does that mean? Because they're really not giving you a grace period. They're increasing your interest rate if you don't pay them on time. They call it a grace period, but it costs you. That's not grace. Banks have a grace thing in their loans, but it's the same thing. We say that to each other, like, I need you to be gracious to me. What we're saying is, I need you to like, give me mercy and with no consequences, which is not grace. And we use grace in all sorts of ways, and we're not even sure sometimes what we mean. So let's, let's do a look at what it is before we jump into what this act of grace is God's doing in the Macedonian churches. 
One of the probably the most common definitions you've heard of grace is literally what it means in the Greek is just it's a favor or gift. And the way it was used in the scripture most commonly was as an undeserved favor, as it's talking about God's grace. It's this undeserved favor of God or the undeserved gift of God. But it's so much more deep and rich and, and more breadth to it than just that. What we start to see as we look at a little bit in the scriptures is that grace is actually a disposition of God's heart. It's actually part of the character of who he is. It's the way his heart leans. That is, he wants to, in some way, undeservedly give you and I his favor. But it's not just that he's giving you something that's detached from him. He's giving you his favor through his presence. And there's a whole bunch of verses that speak to this, but I want to point out three to you here as we get rolling. So here's the first one. 1 Corinthians 1, 4 tells us, I give thanks, Paul, saying this, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God. This grace of God, this undeserved, extravagant grace of God that it was given to us, how? In Christ Jesus, actually through the person and the work of Christ Jesus. John 1, 14 tells us, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Who is full of grace? Jesus was. Who was the person who had grace? Jesus was. God is full of grace. And in verse 16 of chapter of John 1, he says, for from his fullness, as Justin just read to us at the beginning of this, from the fullness of who Jesus was, you and I have received, and listen to how he says this, grace upon grace. One of the things we learn about grace as we walk through the scripture is it's the extravagant, undeserved favor of God that comes through the very presence of Jesus. There's more to it than that. It's not just the undeserved favor of God. It actually, as the undeserved extravagant favor of God starts to enact in our life, it spills over into God's power. And you see the word grace used through scripture talking about a power that's in us, working in us and through us. Not just in us, but through us. Here's three more verses. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God has appeared. Now, who did the grace of God appear in? Again, Jesus in a person and the King and our Lord. And notice what the power of this grace did. It brought salvation to all people. Grace isn't just a favor that's given. It's, it's the energizing power of God that actually changes us, works in us and through us. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, very familiar verse maybe to many of you. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, not just a little bit, but all grace. So that having all sufficiency in all things, what grace does, all sufficiency in all things, you may be able to, and here's the power of this energizing grace, abound in every good work. The things that God calls us to, he gives us grace to fulfill. And we say that word like God gave me grace to do this. And do you know what you're saying when you say that? Because here's what you're saying when you say, God gave me the grace to live this out. God gave me the grace to speak the way I did to my child. God gave me the grace to forgive this person. What you're saying is the undeserved favor of God that has rested on my life through Jesus Christ has worked in me in such a way that now it's empowering me to live out this grace by giving forgiveness to this person or by giving love to this person. So we're not just saying, man, I was kind today. What you're saying is the very presence of God working in me is working through me in this moment. One last verse, Second Corinthians, excuse me, First, first Peter 5, 10. And after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, I love this. Not a God of little grace, not a God of some grace, but all grace. Watch how this energizing power of God works in us, who has called you to eternal glory after you've suffered for a little while. He himself, and this is what grace does, will restore you, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. They are so connected biblically that God's grace is, is the favor of God resting on us in his presence, but it's also the power of God through his presence working through us. They're so connected in the word of God that if God's grace is in you and it's not working through you. Some of the writers say that you don't actually have the grace of God. James says it this way, faith without works is dead. Like if, the, if you're saying the grace of God lives in my life, but the grace of God is not actively changing your heart so it's coming out of you in a way that only God can do, then does the grace of God really live in you? Or is it just a word we're using like the banks and the credit cards? Because Paul, as he starts this passage tells us, I want you to know, brothers, in Corinth, these people that he's been telling, let's reconcile, let's walk together. I want you to know about an act of grace that God has poured out on the churches in Macedonia. Now, hear what he's saying now. I want you to understand the undeserved favor and power of God that's been poured out through his presence in these churches in Macedonia. And so when that grace got lavished upon these churches, what was the result? Verse two tells us, for in a severe test of affliction, 
I want you to notice three things going on here. First, they were in a severe test of affliction, these churches in Macedonia. We're not really sure what. We just know that there was a lot of crisis. This word means being pressed down. They were being persecuted. We do know this, but there were other things going on. We believe there was a famine maybe going on at this time. And that maybe the churches in this region were really suffering a lot. So in the middle of a severe affliction, a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy, that's the second thing I want you to notice, and their extreme poverty. So get these three things. They're being pressed on, being persecuted. There's an abundance of joy and they're living in poverty. Do those go together for you? Now, I, I would gather because there's so many people in this room and so many people watching on the stream that there's been people that have actually lived in poverty that are listening to my voice right now. Like what would be defined as poverty by the United States. Some of you might say you're poor, but really there's a difference between poor and poverty. The, the word here is like, we, we don't know how we're gonna eat. That's what poverty means. Our next meal. And maybe you've lived like that and you know the, the, the struggles and the, the, just the, the pain of that. But have you lived in the middle of poverty while you're being persecuted? And have you lived in the middle of poverty while you're being persecuted and had great joy? So that's what's going on in these churches. And the test of great affliction, there's an abundance of joy and their extreme poverty. And here's the result of all this. It overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Overflowed means excessive abundance. Wealth means excessive abundance of riches. And generosity is like holding nothing back. When you put all three of those together, excessive abundance of riches holding nothing back, you get extravagant giving. We're gonna walk through what, what extravagant giving looks like in these next couple of verses. And, and please don't miss what you're about to see because everything you're gonna see on this list is above me and you. It's beyond you and me and it's impossible. Matter of fact, the temptation as you start hearing this list is to feel guilty. The temptation as you start hearing this list is gonna be to wanna run back and stuff the joy box. Thank you, somebody was paying attention. You're not familiar with the joy box is? I won't say it again, I promise, till the end of the night. You're gonna, have, you're gonna have this temptation in you to go find Lauren. She's not here, but you're gonna have this temptation to go find Lauren and say, Lauren, man, I'll work in ML Kids at least once. <laughs> because this, it, and by the way, that's not extravagance. That's not even generous. That's guilt. That's not godly grief, that's worldly grief. And so as we start unpacking this list, can I just encourage you, let it do what it's supposed to do, overwhelm you. If you look at the list and go, man, I got this. We got another list to talk about. So here we go. What is godly extravagant giving? Right out of this verse, severe test of affliction, abundance of joy, extreme poverty. Here's the first thing. What is godly extravagant giving? It is independent of our circumstances. Godly extravagant giving is absolutely independent of your circumstances. In this passage, it says in a severe test of affliction. It doesn't say after their their affliction was over. It doesn't say when the, when the persecution stopped, then they started giving. It says, no, in the middle of a great persecution, they gave extravagantly. It's absolutely independent of our circumstances. It's not about how you're doing. It's not about how you're feeling. Second thing, it's a partner of joy. And I love this. I love that extravagant giving is a partner of joy. Their abundance of joy. Now, how, how does this happen? Well, if this really is an act of grace, and remember how we, how we talked about and defined grace, that it's actually this, the presence of God undeservingly given to us in an extravagant way, and it results in his favor and his power. That really is, this really is an act of grace, then the presence of God is what brought them their joy. We've been talking about this over the last couple of chapters in 2 Corinthians. Psalm reminds us in 1611 that there is fullness of joy in God's presence. Where God's presence is, undeservedly there is grace. And where that extravagant grace is, there's gonna be joy. And what's amazing about this church and these churches that he's talking about is in the middle of their affliction, they knew joy. Why? And the only reason there could be is because of God's presence. And one of the things that I know about extravagant giving from all the people that are around me that are extravagant givers is joy is a partner of their extravagant giving. Now their extravagant giving isn't what leads to joy. I think it's their joy that leads to extravagant giving, but they're always partnered together. Here's the third thing. It is about cost. 
It's not about how much you have or give or even just about money. It says in their extreme poverty, they overflowed in a wealth of generosity in their part. It's not about cost and it's not about how much. It's really not even about money. Let, let me say this first. Extravagant giving is always about money, but it's not just about money. You can't say, hey, you know, I have the gift of giving, but I never really give money. I just give my time. That's, that's not the gift of giving. In the scripture, giving is always about resources and money. When Paul sent Titus to this church to take a collection for the saints, he didn't come back with caravans of cows. Titus came back with money. Now, how they did that and what they did, I have no idea, but giving is always about money, but it is more than that as you're gonna see as we walk through this passage. It is about how we give our time. It is about how we give of ourselves, of our love, of our service. But it absolutely can't be minus money. But it is about cost, most of all. Let me, let me explain it this way. Bill Gates is one of the richest men in the United States. Right now, he is currently worth $125 billion with a B. He could build 125 Jerry Jones worlds. $125 billion. In his lifetime, he started a charity that he has given over $50 billion to. Now, don't miss this. The man's given 50, he and his wife have given 50 billion with a B dollars to a charity that's doing some pretty cool stuff in this world. During the middle of COVID, they give billions of dollars to, to the middle of this, to try to come up with cures for this. Whatever you think of this man, he's given $50 billion. But I wanna ask you this question, is that extravagant giving when you still have $125 billion? Sounds like it. I mean, if somebody gave you $1 billion, you would think extravagant. But according to God's definition, is it extravagant? We were in Guatemala several years ago. Guatemala, when I was a pastor at the summit, was our Ecuador to what Matthias goes to Ecuador every year. Matthias has been to Ecuador about, four, about 14 years. So some 28 times we've been to Ecuador as a church. We went to Guatemala, worked in the mountains, some mountain pastors through it, through a guy who helped train these pastors to plant churches in the mountains of Guatemala. One of those times we were up in the middle of, of one of these villages, very, very remote, so remote, so high that we had to spend the night there, which was really a blast. We got to see it lightning and thunderstorm and rain below us. I don't know if you've ever been that high up in the mountains where that happens. Like we were up so high that we saw clouds, thunderstorming and lightning below us as it rained. It was amazing. As we were up there, we got to spend, the, spend part of the day praying for this one pastor this who was up there, who, who all of these pastors, by the way, are, are like tri-vocational. They don't just have one job, they have three. They're, they pick peanuts, they make leather crafts, they do other things and on their side, they preach and start a church. And we were in this man's house praying for him, encouraging him, getting ready to do the service with him that night and trying to serve him. And, and we were with him that night and it was, we'd brought our own little peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And so we were eating our peanut butter and jelly and our, and our bag of chips and sharing our food with him. And it was, it was great. We brought to that village hundreds of pounds of food that we brought to the pastor and then the pastor and some of his men and women would, would go with us around to different people in the village and we would give them these big bags of rice and beans and oil and different things for people that were living in poverty. And we also gave a huge bag to the pastor of rice and beans and other things. Well, that night when the service was over, we went back up to his house. And when we came in, it was about 10.30, maybe 11, because services are really long. You think Mark preaches long? Man. Man, Mark would be right at home in this place because there's like three people preaching and they all preach for like 45 to an hour. And you just pack a lunch because you're, you're gonna be there a while. And so about 11 o'clock, we got done with that service that night and we went back to this pastor's house because he had this patio we were gonna sleep on. And we got there and when we walked in, his wife and these ladies brought out food that we didn't expect. And they came out with rice and beans and this chicken soup and homemade tortillas. And as here, here's what happened. My brain started remembering earlier in the day that what one of the men had told us on the way up there that we were serving was that what we were bringing them because there were some things that had happened up in their village was what they were gonna be living on for the next couple of weeks. And what they had done is taken this bag of food that we had brought them and they had taken the rice and beans in there and used it to serve us. On top of that, what they did is they killed their only chicken. I noticed that afternoon, this one chicken running around, it was a scary looking chicken. They, they, they breed chickens with all sorts of things around there. And so you have these like demonic looking chickens running around. And there was this crazy looking chicken running around that was scaring our girls. And I remember seeing this chicken. And at some point in time that night when we were eating, I remember thinking, 
the chicken's not here. And Alex, who goes up in the mountains with us, one of our pastors who speaks Spanish, I called Alex over and I said, Alex, did they kill their chicken for us? And he said, yes. And we were eating their last piece of meat. Now, when you give $25 billion or $50 billion and you still have 125, that can appear extravagant. When you give your last chicken and the food that somebody else just brought you, that's extravagance. That, that's extravagance. And what was beautiful about that is that we laughed that night. We sang that night. That pastor had such joy in his face and not just serving us, but just in his life as you talked to him and got to be around him. And all of us Americans, whenever you get around people like that, you're like, why are they so happy? Because I wouldn't be happy in that situation, sleeping on a dirt floor with a crazy chicken, no food, and then giving my food away to somebody else. Not a rest, it doesn't equal joy. But there's something about godly extravagant giving that in the middle of affliction, not about our circumstance, that partners us with joy, that allows the cost not to be even counted or to consider the cost is not too high. Maybe it's a better way to say that. Verse three, for they gave according to their means, Paul says, and as I can testify, beyond their means. Some people talk about this being they gave in two different ways. Some gave according to their means, some gave beyond. You look at the Greek and the language here, what's going on? He's not saying some gave this way, some gave this way. What he's saying is they gave according to their means, and what I can testify is they gave way beyond their means. Like they, they gave beyond their ability. And when he uses the word means here, he's talking about two things. He gave beyond their, beyond their physical ability. They had this much, they gave more. And not only that, it wasn't just beyond their physical ability, it was, it was beyond their ability, their will. Like godly extravagant giving is always beyond your will. There, there's not, if you can will it, it's not godly, probably. If you can will it, it's probably not extravagant. Godly extravagant giving is always gonna be beyond our will. It's gonna compete with the, strategery of our brain. It's gonna conflict with the part of us that, is, that reasons out, how is this gonna work out? It says they gave according to their means as I can testify and beyond their means. And the very last part of that verse says of their own accord. It's spirit led. One of the things that happens when extravagant giving is it's not pressured from the outside. It's, it's, it's something that happens from the inside as the spirit of God's living in you and the grace of God is living in you. The undeserved favor and power of God living in you then starts to press itself out of you. Then from inside out, our decisions start to be based on the spirit leading us to do this. I've had people ask me all the time, like, well, hey, is, is, is tithing then a thing we have to do? Like as the church and giving, Paul's not talking about tithing here, but people ask this question all the time, like, hey, are, are we still supposed to tithe? Is that, is that a command that we have to carry out? And I'm like, well, if you want to get really technical and legal about it, part, part of me would say no. But what I will tell you is this, that in the New Testament, Jesus says everything is his. And so it's no longer 10% like the Old Testament, it's all of you. And so if you want to get an argument about how much you're supposed to give to God, God says really all of it's mine. Have you ever noticed how easy it is to give away other people's stuff? Have you ever noticed that? I was gonna do this tonight, but I didn't have time to do this. I was gonna go like give somebody a hundred dollar bill like DeMontre here. And I was gonna walk up to DeMontre and say, DeMontre, I have any money on you? And he's gonna say, oh, maybe. He's gonna look in his wallet. He's gonna, oh, look, I got a hundred. I was gonna take it out, walk over here and give it to Aaron. Afterwards, I'd go get it back because it's not my money to give away, right? But my point in the illustration was this. Hey, how easy is this for John to give away DeMontre's money, isn't it? Because it's not my money. Have you ever done that with other people's stuff? Like you do that with your kids stuff all the time. You're like, you get tired of all their stuff and they're in your, in your basement and you're like, you go give it away. And then your kids come in and like, where did my, and you're, I, I gave it to these other, and you're like, why? <laughs> it didn't matter to you, it's not yours. We give our spouses stuff away all the time. We give everybody stuff away because it's so easy to give other people stuff away. My point is this, if it's not yours, half the battle stops for you and I. Verse four, it says, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. These, these people were being so moved by, by what was going on that it, their hearts got gripped. Part of what extravagant giving does is it grips your heart and it grips your heart in such a way that you can't stop it 
and you can't make it go away and eventually you just have to do it. You've been there before where you just said, man, I wanna give these people this and somebody in your family said, what are we doing? Why are we doing? And you're like, eh. And so you kind of just put it back here in the back of your brain and then you couldn't stop and you couldn't stop and eventually you just did because extravagant gripping, giving grips our heart. It doesn't let go. They sincerely pleaded with Paul to give because their heart was gripped. And this, this is where we start moving from the what, what extravagant giving looks like to why. Because what gripped their heart was the why. The reason they were so desirous to give was the why. Which begs the question, why? Why is God calling us to extravagant giving? What always shows us what it looks like. Why is what starts to move our hearts towards God and how he gives. I had a friend that every Christmas when he was, I think he had turned 40, might've been 45. But when he turned whatever age that was, he decided with his wife that they were gonna walk around through their house and give away the one, he decided this, I don't think his wife did, but he decided he was gonna walk through his house and give away the one thing that he treasured most. Now it couldn't be his wife, couldn't be his kid. At first, it started off as not being their house or cars, but I think that even happened after a while. So he like, would walk through us. He was a musician, led worship, church we were in. He would give away keyboards and guitars and all sorts of things that were his. He would just walk into somebody's place one day, some friend, some 20-year-old that he knew was learning how to play guitar, and he would hand them like this $1,000 you know, Martin guitar and say, here, I want you to have this. And the, the, the 20-year-old's like this, well, what? And it was something he started doing over the course of three or four or five years. And then he realized something that really he was doing this for himself more than he was doing this for God or the people he was giving it to. He realized that this, this discipline that he was doing was more about trying to teach himself not to worship the stuff he had. And it was, it was, it was helpful because we need to not believe that we own and own the stuff we have that really it's God. But what it, what it wasn't doing was stirring his heart and his affections for Christ. It wasn't helping him see the extravagance of God's grace towards him or even the desire to give extravagantly to other people. All it was doing was making him hate his stuff. It was making him numb to his stuff because he started figuring out after a while, if I don't like any of this, then I don't have to give it away. Because he had tricked himself that way. Like, I'm, I'm just not gonna like anything and then, then I'll give away like an apple instead of my thousand dollar guitar. And he realized like, hey, this whole thing's kind of backfired on me. This whole point of this was to give extravagantly. What it became was just a way to numb himself to the stuff he had. And so he stopped doing this. You can see the what in extravagant giving all you want, but until the why starts to anchor deep down into your hearts, you're not gonna be moved towards the affections of Christ. So what are the whys? What are the whys? Beginning in verse four again, he says, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Why are you and I called to godly extravagant giving? The first thing it tells us there's the relief of the saints. Practically, it meets many various needs. We're not sure what was going on with these saints. We're not sure if some people think that there was this uh, famine going on in Jerusalem. There'd been, there'd been all sorts of things happening. The, the saints in Jerusalem, it's written about in, in Acts chapter 16 and a couple, Romans chapter 15 that the, the early church then took a relief effort together to provide for the saints in Jerusalem that were going through an incredibly hard time of poverty and starvation. Maybe that what this was. Maybe it was another instance like this, but whatever it was, Paul is starting to rally these churches in this part of the world to give to some saints that were in need, in desperate need. These poor churches that were being persecuted in Macedonia begged Paul to be a part of this need because they saw a need and then they knew in their giving it was gonna meet a very practical need. Extravagant giving always meets many various needs. Man, People ask me all the time, again, well, like, what about the tithing thing? What I realize is this, is that as, as a body of Christ, as the, as the body of Christ, if we would give the way God calls us to, we would meet so many needs in this community, so many needs in this church that we would never have to ask. Do you realize that, that when God established this as all the way back in the Old Testament, all the way through the New Testament, there wasn't governments taking care of people like we have now. We, we live in one of the weird times in, in, a, in the culture of our of our world where governments actually take care of people. But you, you go back a couple of 200 years and governments didn't do that. You know who took care of people? It was the church. 
starting in Jesus' day when Jesus left, all the way for about the next 1,500 years, it was the church who took care of the poor. It was the church who took care of the people who had the plague. It was the church who took care of the people that were starving. It was the church who interceded in the middle of all these things while the government bit palaces like we saw on the wall a minute ago. Because God was teaching his people to extravagantly give. Somewhere in the middle of that, we've let the government take our place. And I'm not saying the government... I'm not even saying anything political about that. Don't hear me say that. What I'm saying is God called the church to extravagant giving. And as we give the way God calls us to, man, we can meet so many needs, send so many missionaries, plant so many churches, affect so many lives in the middle of our body and outside of this place. Practically meets a ton of needs. But here's the deeper thing. They said they were begging earnestly for the favor. The word favor there is the word grace in the Greek. It's the same word. It's where we get the definition, the the undeserved favor of God. They were begging Paul for the grace of being able to meet these needs. Here's the deeper why of why we give. We give because we've been so impacted by the undeserved favor and power of God in our own lives that we long for other people to taste it going out this way. When that starts to happen in your life, you kill your last chicken and you take the rice and beans that someone has just given you and you make it for them because you so long for them to taste what you've tasted in the undeserved favor and power of God that you know that one of the ways they're gonna be able to taste that is as you give to them in their great need. They believe this. Paul said in verse one, I'm gonna take you back to what he said at the beginning of this. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. He's not talking about what was going through them. He was talking about how God poured out grace on these churches in Macedonia. And what happened then then was this grace of God going out. Do you want others to know what you've tasted in Christ? Do you want others to know what you've tasted in Christ? Here's the truth. One way or another, people, they get a taste of what you're tasting. And one of the greatest ways they get a taste of of what you've tasted in Christ is how you give, how you give of your time, how you give of your love, how you give of your service, how you give of your money. Those that live in our house, parents, and they get a huge taste of the grace you've received from Jesus Christ by how they watch you give. What's that taste like for our kids? They're either tasting the extravagant grace of God where his godly presence and power has been poured out on us in such a way that we long to give it out to other people or they start to taste a different God, one who only gives us what we earn or even worse, a stingy, selfish God. When I was 15, I got to, I I say got to, I, I was made to go to a basketball banquet as a freshman in high school. And I say made because I I didn't own any nice anything and I had to wear a tie, a shirt and tie to this thing. And I had to dress up and my my idea of dressing up consisted of not wearing shorts. That was my idea of not dressing up as a ninth grader. I grew up in South Texas, it's hot all the time, so we wore shorts. Wearing long pants was hell, literally. And so I was gonna have to wear long pants with a nice shirt and a tie, which I didn't own any of. My mom actually bought me a pair of long pants and then went into my brother's closet, who had already graduated and gone to college, and pulled out one of his nice shirts that he left at home. Now, I want you to understand, this is 1979. 1979 means, I don't know, like a disco, um, Saturday Night Fever, John Travolta, right? And he went into my brother's, she went into my brother's closet and pulled out this silk, it wasn't silk, it was fake silk shirt, but it was real shiny and, and had the big, collar on it. And man, I was like, I get to wear that. Like my brother would kill me if he knew I was going to wear this. And so she pulled this shirt out and, and while I was putting it on, there's something inside of you that starts just doing this, right? You just start like, <laughs> and in your head, you hear the, you hear the Bee Gees, <laughs> right? All this is going off in your head, right? Staying alive. So all this is going on in my head. And I, and my mom says, Hey, go into your dad's room and pick out a tie to go with this shirt. And so I, so I go into my dad's room and I sit on the edge of his bed and I open his closet and I look in there and I was like, oh my Lord. Like I had like John Travolta Saturday Night Fever on and my dad had like Frank Sinatra in his closet. <laughs> it's 1979 and everything my dad had in that closet was from the 50s and the 60s and it was old and tired Frank Sinatra. And I sat on the edge of that bed and I just, I just thought to myself like, this isn't gonna work. And my mom came in and she said, Did you pick a tie out? And I was like, have you seen what's in his closet? Like she doesn't know. Have you seen what's in his closet? 
And she said, yeah, you can get something out of here. And they were all really thin ties, which are kind of in now, but all these little thin, little bitty ties that weren't like the big fat ties that I wanted to wear in 1979, right? And I looked at her and I said, Whoa. and my best ninth grade, like put off, roll my eyes voice, like why is everything in his closet old and tired? And my mom looked at me and said, everything in his closet is old and tired so you can have stuff that is new and fresh. And I sat on my bed, melted into their bed at that moment and realized for the first time in my life what like giving actually looked like. I've never forgot that whole scene. And I've told that story a billion and one times. And every time I get to tell it to my dad, he's like, really? And because my dad is the most unassuming giver you're ever gonna run into in your life. He's a pastor who didn't make much money his own life, his whole life, church planner, but he gave more than we had all the time, so much so that it made my mom mad. And I didn't know how much he was actually giving to me my whole life until I found out how much he was not doing for himself because of how he was giving to me. I can still, to this day, taste the extravagant love of God's grace through my dad's giving, to this day. He's 90 years old and my dad supports more church planners and missionaries and residents and interns than anybody I know on, on a pension. And I, I don't want you to hear this, like the why my dad does that is all about he wants other people to taste the extravagant grace of God. Others are gonna taste how you give and they're gonna taste something about who God is through it. And my question to you is, is not are you moved by the why? Because I think you want other people to taste the grace of God. The, really question, the, the big question is like, how then do we give away that which our will absolutely just doesn't wanna do? Whether it's your time or your love or your money. Verse five is where the how unpacks. And this, Paul says, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. How, how do you live out godly extravagant giving? They gave themselves first to the Lord. If we're gonna join God in this call to extravagant godly giving, there's gonna have to be a change of ownership. You and I are gonna have to change our ideas about who owns what. There's, there's some of us that, that, that really functionally understand that, that God owns me and everything I am, but we still, in our reality of our lives, we compartmentalize like this is mine, this is God's. And so we have our, our stuff, our time, our places, our things we do that are ours, and then this is God's stuff. And we've compartmentalized our lives into our stuff and God's stuff. For others of us, it's just all ours. And, and we give God sometimes leftovers or we give God sometimes like an offering. Like, well, here, God, I'll, I'll give you this. We walk into the room with 34 apples and we eat 32 of them. We have two left and we take a bite out of one. We give one to God. And that's kind of how we live our lives. We spend everything we have and whatever we have left over at the end of the month, we kind of bring it to God and we, we do this. Like, yeah, I ain't got much left going on here. I ain't got much left going on. Oh, here's some. And then that's what we give to God. And so really the reality of that life is that it's yours. And what's left over goes to God, if you will be honest. What has to happen if we're gonna join God in extravagant godly giving, if we're not gonna look at a list and just feel guilty, if we're not gonna look at a list and just run and stuff the joy box. Sorry, I said it again. But here, here's what's gonna have to happen. You and I are gonna have to change ownership tonight. We're gonna have to realize what Paul tells the, told the church in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. And you weren't bought with a small price, you are bought with an extravagant price. You were bought with every bit of Christ's life, every bit of Christ being, every bit of who he was, every bit of his flesh, every bit of his relationship with God the Father and God the Spirit that was separated from some tiny second on the cross as he cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? Everything about Christ and what he gave up to purchase you was extravagant. And if you and I are going to begin to give extravagantly, it's gonna begin with a change of ownership to realize I am not my own, which means this, everything that I have and everything that I am is his. Which makes it really scary for some of us right now in this room because we're starting to realize this. If that's true, then God can ask anything of me and I can't say no. 
which is why the rich young ruler walked away from Jesus. G giving his money wasn't gonna get him into the kingdom. Jesus knew that until he gave him his money, he was never gonna give him himself. Like there's something that we all hold on to in the surrender of our souls before Jesus. And, and if we are going to extravagantly give ourselves away as God calls us to, there's gonna have to be a change of ownership. I said this at the beginning, but I, I'm, I want for us as a church to not make giving an off subject topic anymore. I want for us as in our lot families and in our discipleship groups, for us to talk about how we're spending our money, for talk about how we're spending our time, to talk about how we're giving to people in need because right now going Psh, no fly zone in that area is not godly. Being, unaf being afraid to bring it up in our, in our homes is ungodly. Being intimidated by what people will think of us or what people will say to us. Now we've got to do it in a gracious way, right? You've had the undeserved favor of God poured out in your life. So in some kind of gracious way, we have to approach people with the same humility that God's poured out his presence on us with as we have this conversation. But we need to ask questions or we're never gonna to get to the place where ownership completely changes. We're gonna compartmentalize stuff that's his and ours. One of the greatest roadblocks, and I, I wanna make really clear what I'm about to say here, one of the greatest sins to my obedient giving is extravagantly believing that I'm not my own. I think this is why the Western church, as Mark talked about the last two weeks, is so full of consumers. We come in and we bring our Bibles and our journals and we take a ton of notes because we consume everything that the pastor can give us, but we walk out and live our lives for ourselves. Give a little bit to this place, give a little bit to this ministry, give a little bit here, and we absolutely just consume because we believe this is our life. One of the greatest roadblocks, one of the greatest hindrances, one of the greatest sins in my own life is believing that my life is my own. You've been bought with an extravagant price. Verse five then talks about the outflow. When you and I start to turn over ourselves to Christ, when we start to change ownership and allow God to be the rightful owner, the one who has bought us, this is what he says the outflow is. And this, not as we expected, they gave themselves first to the Lord, then what? What happens? Then to us by the will of God. When you surrender who you are to God, then your stuff isn't yours and it gets easy to give away his $100 bill, doesn't it? All of a sudden we start realizing this isn't mine. I will give as God calls me to. I will serve as God calls me to. I will lay down where God asks me to. Second part of what it looks like how we walk in this is we've got to give yourself to the Lord's extravagant grace. I'm going to get real tangibly practical with this in a minute. But we have to get in the practice daily of giving ourselves to the Lord's extravagant grace. Turning over ownership means giving ourselves to the Lord's grace and then you will begin to extravagantly give in grace. Now, I wanna get real practical with what that looks like. I've got three things we're gonna walk together as a church here in just a minute. But I want you to hear Paul exhorting the church to this as he gets to the end of this passage. In verse six, he says, accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, he should complete among you this act of grace. Notice what he calls it again, an act of grace. It was an act of grace in Macedonia that poured out all this extravagant giving to the, to the saints in need. And now he's telling the church in Corinth that this is gonna happen in your lives. It's gonna be an act of grace. That's the only way it's gonna happen. God's undeserved favor and power on you, working in you and through you. So he tells him, Titus, this, this work got started among the Corinthian church. I'm sending Titus back there to complete this. Maybe they promised they would give some money at some point in time. And Paul says, man, I'm, I'm gonna hold you to this because these people are in need. And I want you to see what it's done to these Macedonian churches. And I want you to see what it's gonna do in your own heart. So he tells them in verse seven, as you excel in everything in faith and speech and knowledge and all earnest and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace. We are called to extravagant giving. So how do you give yourself to the Lord's extravagant grace? What does it look like? I have a ton of thoughts, but I'm gonna give you three and then we're actually gonna practice them together. The first one is daily ongoing repentance. We talked about repentance last week. If you missed that sermon, man, go listen to it. Go watch it, it's amazing. One of the things I've learned as I've grown in my walk with Jesus Christ is that repentance, 
when it only happens when you get caught is not repentance usually. And I've learned this, that is the more you mature in Christ, the more you repent. It's not because you sin more, you're just more aware of your sin. It's not because you're finding yourself not being able to to obey, you're finding yourself when you don't obey, more prone to run back to Jesus because his grace is so extravagant, he's accepted you so freely, he's forgiven you so greatly that you wanna run to that person, not hide. And so I don't run to Jesus for forgiveness, I run to Jesus because he forgives me. And because he's already forgiven me before I've gotten there, just like he did the prodigal son when the son ran up and said, oh God, and he started into a speech, God stopped him and said, bring the shoes, bring the robe, bring the calf. That's how God meets us. Daily, you and I have to repent. Right now, we're gonna begin with this. We're gonna repent of owning ourselves and we're gonna say, God, ownership has to change. And we're gonna pray right now. We're gonna do three things. We're gonna pray for this. I'm gonna lead us to another one and I'm gonna lead us to a last one. We're gonna begin right here in this place. I don't, I don't know where your heart is right at this moment, but I know if you're like me, that some part of you struggles with owning some part of who you are, maybe all of it. If you've never laid down ownership of your life before Jesus Christ, if you've never realized he bought your life and this, this repentance tonight may be a, a salvation moment where God actually claims your soul and owns you because he bought you with Jesus Christ. If you've already surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and said, I know that you're the only one that makes me right before God, then, then maybe tonight is a, is, a, is a looking and saying, God, ownership has to be completely yours, not just partly. And so let's pray. Let's walk before God together in repentance. God, hear our prayers. We come to you in this place right now, not, not because we're trying to earn your forgiveness, but because God, you've given it to us, you've earned it in Christ. And so here are prayers all across this room from people that have, that have withheld our stuff lives from you, our stuff from you, our money from you, saying this is mine. God, tonight, make there be a change of ownership. We repent from owning ourselves and we turn to you, the one who's extravagantly bought us. We turn to the affection and the love that you have for us and we give ourselves to you. We bend our knees to you and say, God, we are all yours. I'm gonna give you a moment. Repent before your father. Turn from owning Turn to him and lay down your whole life before him. Here's the second way we... we give ourselves to extravagant grace. The first way is repentance. Every time you repent, you're having to trust the grace of God, that it's extravagant, that it's gonna cover daily. Learn to do this. Second is daily voicing your desperate need of Jesus. Giving your weakness to God for his power. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 12, nine. But God said to him, my grace, notice what is sufficient, my grace, the undeserved presence of God that brings his power that makes perfect your weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so the power of Christ may rest upon me. When he's talking about weaknesses, he's not talking about your sin. He's talking about live real life human weaknesses. So for those of you that are old, can I say this to you? Like, I'm, that's a relative term. I'm 57, I feel old. When I go to my father's place where he lives, everybody's 85 and older, I feel pretty young. <laughs> but if you're old, one of the weaknesses that you have right now is your body hurts. One of the weaknesses you have right now is that you can't do all the things you used to be able to do. One of the weaknesses you have right now is that you grieve a lot because a lot of the people in your life are turning away from Jesus. You grieve a lot because people are dying that you cared about. You grieve a lot because you've seen a lot of the brokenness of this world. And that's a weakness, not a sin. And instead of hiding that weakness, we need to bring that grief before the Lord so he can, in his grace, bring power. Whether it's in your body or it's in your mind or your soul. If you're young, and you wanna step up to the table and lead, sometimes it's a weakness because you just don't know. You've not been trained yet, but man, you wanna go. You don't know enough, and so sometimes it holds you back, or maybe you make errors because you just haven't done it before. Can I say that's a weakness, not a sin, most of the time? 
And instead of hiding that, bring it before the Lord and say, God, in this weakness, will you make strength for you out of your grace? Not, not just to make it stronger so that you look better, but maybe it's gonna be a weakness your whole life. Maybe you struggle being in crowds of people, being gracious to those that aren't welcomed in a place. And maybe in your lot family or in this place, God's asking you to talk to people that aren't talking to anybody. And you're like, man, I'm an introvert. That's, listen, that's a weakness, not a sin. And maybe God can take that weakness and by his grace, make it a strength, not so that you become an extrovert, but so that you become somebody that can just make one other person feel welcomed and not alone. That's the grace of God. Stop hiding your weaknesses. Stop hiding the fact that you have a hard boss you have a hard job, you have kids that are rebellious, that discipline is difficult, that being a parent is the most difficult thing you've ever thought about doing in your whole life and you wanna quit all the time, that's a sin. What's not a sin is knowing that parenting is difficult. So right now we're gonna pray and we're gonna say, God, here's my weakness, put your grace on it. And I'm gonna encourage you like daily, this needs to be part of your prayers because it makes you engage the grace, the extravagant grace of God. Father, hear our prayers. We come before you with weakness. And whatever it is that's jumping to your mind right now, just bring it before him. God, this is absolutely a weakness. May I believe that your grace is sufficient. Tell him right now. And the last thing is daily worship. It is the act. What worship is, is bending the knee before God. All through the scripture, wherever the word worship is used, this is physically what the word means. You, you don't worship that which you don't bow before. And so worship every day can be you sitting on your, in your car, raising your hand before holy God and saying, you alone are worthy today. Once again, I remember this is your life, not mine. It can be putting music on your ears and singing to the top of your lungs as you drive to work. It could be, it could be praying with someone you love before you walk out and just worshiping God. It can be sitting on your porch, seeing creation. It can be enjoying a great meal, declaring the greatness of a God who's provided for you. It could be holding a baby, playing with a dog. There's 10 million ways to worship. We're gonna worship in just a minute with a band. How cool is that? But the point is this, will you bend your knee? Will you bend your knee and say, ownership is yours? I'm gonna end with this scripture. This is Mark chapter 12, verse 41. This will lead us into our worship. Jesus was in the temple the last week of his life. He had just been through a really incredibly tough conflict in the temple. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums in the offering box with this huge metal um, funnel that took money down into the treasury. So the more money coins you put in there, the louder the noise was. So you can picture the rich people coming up, just chunking in money and making noise. And a poor widow, verse 42 says, came and put in two small copper coins, which made a penny. And Jesus called his disciples to them. And I believe there was, there was tears in Jesus' eyes. And I believe this like viscerally moved him in his stomach. And he said, truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offer box. All of the Bill Gates that walked up and put in $50 billion, this woman put in more for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty. Hear the last thing he says. She has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. I think this stirred Jesus for so many reasons. He was, he was in a temple where he just had a conflict with a bunch of people that were using his temple to make money and he cleaned them out with whips and cords and ran them out because they weren't giving people a taste of the grace of God, the undeserved favor and presence of God that he was gonna earn them. He was giving them, they were giving people a taste of an angry God, a God who works and makes us work for anything we get from him and Jesus hated that and he cleaned the temple out but there he is in front of this lady watching her give anyone who would see a right taste of who God is. And you know who got the taste because everybody else missed it? Don't miss this. You know who got the taste because everybody else missed it? Let's say it one more time. You know who got the taste because everybody else missed it? Jesus. Jesus got to taste the grace of his father through this woman giving everything she had. And so he calls the disciples over to tell him, hey guys, you need to see this. Everything she had to live on, she gave. And I think this stirred Jesus so because this is what he was getting ready to do at the end of this week. 
everything he had to live on, he was gonna give up on the cross extravagantly so you and I could have everything that he is. And I think it moved him. And it stirred Jesus to worship. And it stirred him to remember the why of extravagant giving so other people would know how great and gracious our God is who undeservedly gives us his presence, his power. So Father, in this place, we wanna dive into your grace. We wanna thrust ourselves into your grace and worship and bend our knee before you because you alone are worthy. So as you stand, maybe you need to sit, maybe you'll kneel, whatever it is, let's bend the knee of our hearts to Jesus and say our ownership is not ours anymore, it's yours. And let's worship the King together.